Whoops, you're muted, Meg. <laughs> Good morning. Here's Meg Riley with a voice. <laughs> In Minneapolis, where spring is coming through, kind of like my voice on mute, but it's going to come. I know it is. There's mud season is here, so that means spring is coming next. Uh, and here we are today with special guests we'll get to in a minute. But meanwhile, Don Fortune, how are you? I am well. Um, spring is threatening here. I have crocuses. Yes, we talked about this last week. I have other little white flowers. I'm not sure what they are, but they're in my yard. Uh, the rabbits are making an appearance and my dog is ignoring them. I think they've worked out some sort of mutual deal where one does not harass the other. Um, but things are good and our pride flag has managed to stay up for another five days. So we're calling that a win here in South Jersey. Uh, Michael, how are you today? I am doing just fine. It is also spring here in Peekskill, New York. And um, you need one of those signs that says it has been this many days since the pride flag was stolen, right? Um, I feel like that sometimes with our Black Lives Matter banner here in Mount Kisco. Um, I'm doing okay. I've got a little sore throat, so you might hear a little less from me this this morning, but but life is good. I am uh, fresh off of an entire day yesterday at the Pride Works for Youth Conference, which is um, a conference here in Westchester County for LGBTQIA plus youth and their adult advisors and allies. And there were um, almost 600 youth at this conference yesterday. And let me tell you how much 600 queer youth, like in a queer space, being their queer selves, um, gives me life. Um, so I'm just like, I'm still kind of floating from that. And uh, it's good. Christina, how are you this morning? Let's see if I can unmute. I'm well. I'm doing well. Thank you so much. Uh, Christina Rivera, I'm joining you from Charlottesville, Virginia, where it is raining, 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 raining to welcome in spring. We're very excited. And um, yeah, just super, super happy to be here with y'all. Jessica, how are you doing? Early morning, Jessica. Listen, I'm I, I'm here for Marga Lee, who's in class at Meadville, and I'm trying to remember how this all goes. And there's some weird thing happening here, like called sunshine. I don't know. We're not. I, it's very strange. It's 8 a.m. There's sunshine. I'll I'll I will be on the chat here, moving your questions along to our hosts and our guests. I'm so excited that my buddy Andre is here, and um, yeah. And Don, you as well, and myself. I'm glad to be here. That's great. And you'll be on Twitter and all of that stuff too. All of that stuff. Okay. Hashtag the view. Hashtag the view. Um, I wanted to mention that Asia Hauser is on a college tour. That's been a theme for Christine and Asia this year, and uh, unable to be online. And so we wish her well. Also a shout out to everyone who's in search. This is the time of waiting when all of the pre-candidating is over and it's kind of like knowing spring is coming here in Minnesota. You know it's gonna happen, but every day seems very, very, very long and cold. So shout out to everybody, uh, particularly people of color, trans people, non gender non-conforming people, people taking particular risks in search, our love is with you, our love is with the congregations. May they be who they can be and may they uh, really live out Unitarian Universalism. We are excited today. Well, Christina, before we get to our special guest, you were at Finding Our Way Home and next week we'll be spending the hour talking about that, but anything you wanna just say quickly? Um, yeah, it was wonderful. I called my husband from Finding Our Way Home and said I wasn't coming home until the weather in Virginia matched the weather in Miami. And so to, I, you know, I could do the co-parenting thing from distance. But no, I came home and I got the rain. Um, but I would just say, yeah, I'm really looking forward to talking about it more in depth next week. Um, a shout out to all of our UU congregations and communities and networks that had folks who went to Finding Our Way Home. Please be gentle with us on our reentry. I mean, it'd be awesome if you could like be super supportive all year long. Um, but particularly when we are coming back from just having such affirming, um, really nurturing space. 
um, to come back into, you know, our primarily um, all white congregations can be um, challenging. And so if you could be super extra supportive of your religious professionals of color that are serving Unitarian Universalism, they're not serving you, um, that would be super awesome. Like, you know, leave them some chocolates or, um, you know, a note on their desk saying how much, how happy you are that they're back and you hope they had a really great time. Like really, um, you know, see what you can do. You, you can think outside of the box and, and come up with something um, that really uh, nurtures and affirms uh, those, those folks in your orbit. And hey, white people, not a good week to just ask stupid questions either. So I, I can say this because, <laughs> you know, I'm white. But, you know, a good week to just, if you wonder, should I say this? Just don't say it. Just have a week of, of just um, maybe being quiet. That's not bad either. <laughs> so I'm really excited to, <laughs> to welcome our special guest today, Reverend Andre Moll who's a developmental assistant minister right now at First UU Society of Burlington, Vermont, where right now it is very cold and muddy, I'm willing to bet you're in mud season like we are. Andre is also a member of the Trust Steering Committee. And Don Fortune, who's been here all month and will be here all month as a guest host, is, ki is kind of a host and a guest today too, as uh, an active trust member. So let's start by talking about what has, been a source of a lot of conversation, uh, the UU World article, and then and what's followed from that. I know that trust has been very active after after that very painful and hurtful article was published. Andre, welcome. Thank you. It's so good to be here. Um, yeah, let's, so let's definitely talk a little bit about about the article. Um, I think so many of us have been busy both on the trust steering committee and many of the members of trust. Um, for those of you that aren't totally familiar with trust, we're a religious professional organization of trans you use. And so we, it's very broad in terms of its membership. So it's not just ordained ministers. We have seminarians, we have lay community ministers, administrators, religious education professionals. Um, so a lot of us found ourselves in the place of being the people that needed to respond to this article and often getting a lot of questions in our congregations about, well, what does this mean? Or why are people upset? I don't get it. Um, so it's definitely been an exhausting couple of weeks for, for many of us. So I know that the steering committee has met with um, the world, uh, with Chris Walton. I don't know if other people at the world as well, but um, I, I've heard very positive things about trusts, um, requests, and um, which which were not new. They were actually made before the article came out, which was part of what was so painful about it. Not from all of trust, but from <laughs> somebody who knew something. So, what do you feel like has been accomplished through the meetings and conversations, and how do you feel now about it? Well, I think it's still early days to kind of say what the accomplishments are. I, we were very deliberate in coming forward and having restorative asks to say, you know, how can we address the harm that's been caused and change the way that we move forward and create a very different relationship, not only for us in trust and trans you use with you, you world, but all marginalized folks within Unitarian Universalism with with you you world so those are the conversations we've started um so it hasn't just been about the article um it's been about the article it's been about the summer issue what's that going to look like and it's been about what are things going to look like going forward um so yeah just the early conversations so far which have been really positive and receptive um there's been a lot of listening, a lot of open to uh, the ideas that we're putting forward and, and action on that. So I think that's really positive, um, but this is, an, this is gonna take time. John, you wanna add anything there? Um, I'm just thinking that this is, this is one of the reasons I'm so glad that Andre is on the steering committee and I'm not um, <laughs> <laughs> because I, I, just don't have the patience 
for that sort of long range, deliberate uh, progress for like, I just, I just like burn it down. Let's, let's come on, let's go, you know, start over. Um, and, and I know that my feelings are legitimate and my thoughts are real and that Andre's going to get a whole lot more done than I will. <laughs> um, and that's just, that's just the truth. Um, you know, while I, when I was that, that Thursday, when I was on the first time, right after the, the blow up, right. I was here talking about some stuff while Andre and Christy were in conversation doing that strategic long range deliberate stuff, you know, and I'm here making noise about whatever, um, but they were doing the, the, the hard work of it. Um, and, and, um, and, you know, this is, this is a thing that we run into. Um, and I think we talked about it with uh, Sharon Welch when we talked about our fringes and how the progressives tend to cut off our fringes, um, whereas the, the conservatives tend to uh, empower them and get them their own TV network. Um, and so my role, and I understand this, my role in most progressive movements is as the noisy fringe. Um, and sometimes my role is simply to make other people more palatable. You know, you can deal with me or you can deal with Andre. <laughs> Which would you prefer? <laughs> you know, and because I'm going to come in and make a lot of noise and you won't like it at all. Or Andre's going to come in and be very reasonable. Um, and it took me a long time in social justice work to understand that that was my role. And I'm also, I also play that role within my own community, within trust, within whatever organization that I'm a part of is that that's part of what I do is, is um, the edges define the center. Um, and without me, we wouldn't be as, as far to the left as we would otherwise be. So that's my role in this. Well, Andre, you know, you mentioned Dawn's language about strategic long-term thinking, and it looks to me like that's what trust has been engaged in, not just re reactively to um, another horrible instance, but, but independently on your own. Can we talk a little bit about the report that you issued, which, uh, was validated greatly by this latest episode <laughs> of the kinds of pain that um, trans and gender nonconforming people are experiencing all the time in our movement. Yeah, yeah, definitely we can. I, one thing I want to want to mention before directly answering that question is um, I'm definitely not the trust steering committee. We've got five members on the trust steering committee. Um, so thank you, Dawn, for all those kind words. But um, there's definitely a, a number of us doing this work and having these conversations. But um, we're a newly elected steering committee that just got elected at the last trust retreat at the end of January. So um, a couple of our members <laughs> were jumping right in uh, with all of this. And yeah, before this article hit, our, our focus was really um, spreading the word on this report that we had done in conjunction with the UUA um, Multicultural Ministries Office uh, back in 2018. And what we did is we we went out to all UU congregations um, and asked for trans UUs to answer the survey, giving us information on their experiences as trans UUs. Um, and we got um, well over 200 responses back and compiled all that into a report which you can find on the trust website um, and actually there's some information on it linked and, and mentioned uh, in the same uu world issue but um, unfortunately got overshadowed uh, by the other article and the, the the real powerful part of this survey is showing that the majority of trans uus do not feel totally welcome and included in their congregations. And, and so that message is completely at odds with this idea that many of our congregations have around our welcoming congregation programs. 
um, which a lot of folks will say are a success. It's been around for 30 years, 75% of our congregations have gone through it. Yet we look at the experience of trans you use and, and most of them feel that they're not fully included. Yeah, they they feel more than that they're not fully included as I read it. They're experiencing microaggressions uh, pretty regularly and um, ignorance, the type of which was just printed in that article, uh, just uh, misinformation and you know, it felt like the article really confirmed the report in a very visible way. Right. And I think the other thing that's really important in, in looking at the report is um, noticing that who who makes up trans use? Trans use are more likely to be low income, disabled, LGBTQ, racially diverse than the average UU population. And when we looked at the survey responses for individuals holding multiple identities, they're more likely to have experienced all of these microaggressions and feel less included by their congregation. So to, to us, looking at that as trust, we, we're seeing that means the answer to this is you can't, there's no one size fix. We've got to look at intersectionality and what this means in our congregations. And clearly we're not the only ones saying that, um, but that's that's a big thing that we've taken away from the report. Yeah, Blue issued a, a really powerful statement in the wake of the World article about intersectionality. And yeah, and so it, the, the group of who makes up trust has really grown. I mean, let's shout out to Barb and Sean, Barb Grieve and Sean Dennison, who really began trust and for a while became trust just so it wasn't just Barb and Sean. And, um, and now it's how many members and, and how, how big was the retreat? Yeah, we have over 60 members, um, which is awesome. And that's a rapid growth just over the last two to three years. Um, and, you know, even with the events over the last couple of weeks, and we've had a huge influx of new folks coming to us and saying, hey, I, I think I belong in trust. Um, so we're, we're very rapidly finding more and more individuals who are working in some sort of professional capacity within Unitarian Universalism and, and joining them in. Um, and so for a long time, our retreat was the main way that we could connect. And in our last retreat, we had just under 30 folks there at the end of January. So it's not, you know, not quite half of our membership was able to go. Um, but as we grow, we're finding more and more ways that we can connect and support each other, which is a, a big piece. And I think the way we were able to hold each other over this last couple of weeks is a testament to the power of having an organization like ours, um, because there was just so much to process, so much to hold um, and different, as as Don was pointing out earlier, we have different reactions and different um, needs that we're bringing forward. and and we need all of that. We, we need all of the different types of reactions and we need all the different types of voices. And so trust, we're, we're able to, to magnify that. So and I think that's super important to point out because, um, you know, as Don was talking about their role, um, I think that works when there is there, the folks that you are pushing towards, you know, the people to work with have those same, are holding those same values and same goals and same um, wants and needs in a different way because too often we see, you know, in our social justice um, world, people who are, you know, what are termed at the radical fringes that, that the institutions don't wanna deal with and so they're dealing with other people that may not necessarily still hold those same values and um, and, and goals. And so that, that, that dichotomy only works when everybody at that table or everybody who's involved in that conversation has those same goals. As otherwise you have folks on the edge who are just continually shouting um, and nobody's listening to, and um, and and they're burning themselves out, right? Um, and that is a real danger of uh, you know 
of getting towards respectability politics or respectability um, that, that we don't want to center. And I think that that's one of the great things that, that I've seen you all do with, with um, not just trust, but the, the, the trans UU population is that you, you all seem to really um, be able to share in what those values are, what those goals are. You may not agree exactly on how to do it. Like, you know, I know in, in our Latinx circles, we don't agree on exactly how to do it, but there, I get a deep sense of love, um, you know, when, when I hear, um, even from the report that you all put out, just the deep caring for each other and for Unitarian Universalism. And that's the part that I'm like, you know, I want to amplify and I want to say, listen, you know, this is, these folks are trying to, trying to tell us something, not just so that they won't be hurt, but so that we can fulfill ourselves as Unitarian Universalists. Like this is about our faith. And, and that's the part that, that I just, one of the parts, there's lots of parts that I love, but um, that I really love how has come out of this, like the deep anger, hurt, and also love, you know, and, and um, I think Dawn and I um, share that same, somewhat that same burn it down mentality, a lot of which, because we've seen this over and over again, like, you know, we have seen this same apology and this same, we're going to do better. And this same um, lack of wanting to really look at the institutional um, oppression that is going on that continues to inform each of these incidents. Like we can go out and put the fire out on each of these incidents, but if we're not addressing these systemic issues of who has this lens, right? Who has this lens? Who is responsible at that table, at the UU world for that lens? And I'm not talking about hiring a person of color to do that or hiring a panel of readers to do that. I'm talking about who is being paid the big bucks to do this, and if they don't have the skills to have that lens, then that is an issue. Um, and and I think you know, particular to this, what happened, I think that's one of the reasons why um, so many people, um, you know, across marginalized communities, were able to to get right in on it because we have all experienced that, and and it's just like you know what fuck it, we're tired of this. We're tired of this same apology every single time coming through. And it, it's clear that that institutional part, the systemic part has not been addressed even a little bit. Well, I'm gonna come in there and, and just remark on the post that Alex Capiton made saying that if it hadn't been for the white supremacy teaching and all of the work that Asia, Christina and Kenny, Wiley, happy birthday, Kenny, uh, did with that, that there would not have been such a widespread, especially from the cis community, understanding of power. And um, so I just want to shout out that two of the people who did that are on this show as hosts regularly, Christina and Asia, and how, what a gift that was to the whole movement to look at who we are and what our values are and who we want to be. Andre? Yeah, I, I just, I just want to say I have been so aware as we've been going through this that the reaction would have been very different if it hadn't been for the hard work of the folks that you just mentioned and, and the work that's been done over the last couple of years, um, not only in the reaction that we received directly um, in posting our article, but, but seeing folks that are also speaking up on our behalf. Um, so it was very evident that, you know, there's been a lot of good work that's been done that, that we were able to, um, to springboard off of, for sure. So I wanted to ask about your retreat. Was it really a retreat as in a time for spiritual renewal or was it a working strategic Catholic <laughs> or was it trying to be both? Um, Don, I'd love to hear your, your thought of that, Don, because I was close to actually like, I was one of the people actually helping plan it. Um, we were trying to strike a balance. Um, I think our retreats in the past have been kind of like, 
we all, this is the time to get together. We've got to build the organization. Um, and we did a little bit of that, but we tried our best to really have a time where we could just connect with each other. Um, I mean, perfect example is I, I, I'm on the steering committee and that was my first time actually getting together with other folks from Trust, um, just because of the timing of the last retreat and I didn't make it. And um, I mean, I, I've known other folks and met them in a one-on-one -on -one capacity, but having that, that ability to get together and spend time together and do a little bit of a retreat, um, I think it was there, <laughs> but it's always a challenge. Um, I, I, it's a, it's a tough balance to hold because we've got all these people who know each other only through Facebook half the time, right? You know, so there's that whole like, wow, your voice doesn't sound like I thought it would, and you're taller, and huh. Um, so there's that like getting to figure out who each other is, and then um, and it was we were in these little cottages which were a lot of fun because then you'd have there were what, four four rooms per little cottage and then there was a big sort of room in the middle where we would get together and solve the world's problems until one in the morning and and that was just that was just delightful um and i know like and this is again this is one of those things like i'm really glad i'm not on a steering committee a steering just because oh my god that's so much work like oh my god that's so much work you know, I'm in my second year of ministry. We're coming up into stewardship season. I'm like, I no, no, I'm going to go um, stare at the mountains for a while. You all can do the the things with the, with the sticky notes on the on the walls and and making lists and that kind of thing. Um, so if I had attended all of the things that our planners were so good to schedule, I might not have thought it was quite so relaxing. Um, but um, what I have learned through the years is that I don't have to show up to everything somebody plans. Um, and that my goal for that period of time was to get um, some, some downtime to spiritually get fed um, and to just for once be someplace where I don't have to explain myself. You know, I don't have to, I mean, the, the, there were conversations where pronouns, yes, I use they, them. Okay. And that was it. There was no, oh, I'm sorry, I did it wrong. There was like, not, it was just, that just doesn't happen in my world. You know, it doesn't happen anywhere where I'm not in a really profound minority. Um, and so that in itself was a big thing. Um, and that in itself required a fair amount of spiritual energy just to sort of absorb and process. Um, I remember when I, when I came out years ago as a little baby dyke and the first time I went to Provincetown and it was the first time I didn't have to be afraid walking down the street. And, and I had to sort of like take some downtime at the hotel and just sort of process what, like how it feels to not be on guard. Um, and so that, that time period in, in Arizona was just delightful and I had to take some time and process what it was to not be the only one. And it was really wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. I see Andre, Andre's nodding. Yeah. That's, that's what that was. So we actually, we have a question from online from uh, Jacaran Oloya, Oloya. Uh, who writes, um, I am interested in hearing your thoughts on willful disobedience and forgiveness. We are expected to forgive and forget despite uh -huh. intentional intervention by Alex. It's frustrating to see this harm happen to another community. Um, so Jacaran would like to hear your thoughts. Who wants Andre, to you want to take that one? Yeah. Um, we, we, this is not a situation of forgive and for, forget and forgive for sure. Um, 
you know, we, we wrestled with what the ask was going to be. Do we take the article down or do we keep it up? Um, and also recognizing that the, you know, online article only reaches a very small percentage of UU readers. So um, the number that was quoted to me from uh, UU World was that only 7% of their readership goes online. So that means that that hard copy article, even with all this conversation over the last couple of week, weeks, is still out there, just the article without the context. So we were very clear that if a, an apology was going to be published, it needed to be hard coded into the article because we knew and much of us were looking at how many folks were sharing the things we were creating and the apologies versus the actual article. And many of us were still seeing a lot of use just posting the article. Um, so we needed to make sure that apology was right there and up front. Um, and, and yeah, it's not forgive and forget for, for all the things Christina was saying earlier, like if we forgive and forget, it's, it's not, nothing's changing. Um, if we don't keep pushing, um, it's definitely not going to change. <laughs> I'm looking, I'm reading the question here. We are expected to forgive and forget. Um, I think that's an implied ex expectation. Um, I don't, there's a part of me that just goes, I don't, I didn't sign any contract on that. Um, we have a theology of universal salvation, which means that everyone is, has the capacity for grace, to receive grace, and everyone has the capacity to receive or to, to get redemption. Um, and we also have a culture, which is sort of odd, that we kind of require um, a scarlet letter wearing period for those who have done great offenses in Unitarian Universalism. Um, they have to wear that publicly for a while before they, uh, they have to do their work publicly to, to heal or fix or whatever else. Um, and I'm not saying this is right or wrong. I'm just saying that, that we, were found, <laughs> we were founded by Puritans and some stuff is honestly genetic systemic stuff. And so we talk about universal salvation, but we also talk about atonement and restorative justice and what does that look like? And so it's, it's not as simple as forgive and forget. I think forgive and forget is a very polite way to spell gaslighting. Um, which is to deny that the harm ever happened. Um, so, um, and that's not, you know, <sighs> compassion without justice is sentimentality. And justice without compassion is brutality. And so what we have to do is find a balance between the two, but a balance that also, um, leans toward extra stuff for the historically marginalized population, right? Um, in the old politics of affirmative action, the, the language they use would be a, 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 um, a boost up, a foot up, right? Get a leg up. Um, and, and currently we hear talk about reparations. Right, that's that's um, another way to do that. And the fact is, we've got this system that historically has, let me like better O'Rourke, historically has um, marginalized or excluded a whole bunch of people. And so we're trying to turn a battleship that has been exclusive for a bazillion years, and. First up, we're trying to turn the battleship, which isn't going to be easy. And we have to make reparations for the damage done, which is going to be just turning the ship is going to 
involve resistance, but turning the ship and giving reparations or awarding reparations because they're not given by any stretch, okay? Um, that's going to that's gonna instigate more resistance. So we have to look at this like Christina was saying, like Andre was saying, this is, this is about a systemic thing. And we can't just put a bandaid on this situation. We have to look at, the, at the, the, the system and the culture that made room for this to happen. And the other piece that Jacaran wrote was about willful disobedience. And as a person who has acquired in the last year two kittens, I have a different interpretation of what willful disobedience looks like. Um, and sometimes what I view as willful disobedience is somebody else's commitment to doing the right thing, right? When I was an editor at a newspaper, we had rules that we had to follow. And the editor, and there's a thing that happens with editors is that we, we, we know what we're doing. And, and nobody else knows what we're doing. And we get into that headset, that mindset, and sometimes we're not able to listen and hear what other people are telling us. Um, and so willful disobedience makes it hurt more, makes it hurt more, you know? I told you not to do this because it would hurt and you did it anyway. And now you're surprised that it hurt. So we've got a lot to unpack there. Yeah, so I was wondering. Thought. I was wondering if you had a response to Jacaran's question. And Andre looks like you have more to say too. But I think this is fruitful ground. Yeah, shall I? Shall I go? Or um, I I wanted to speak a little bit about um, restoration because that's come up in a couple of my comments and a couple of things that Don said. And I want to lift up um, something that. Michael Slack posted on the Blue blog, um, I think it was last week, in response to the UU World article. And it's, it's a very powerful piece, and there's a lot in there. But one specific thing that Michael said was, you know, if we're calling for restoration, the idea of restorative practices is that you're repairing a relationship. But we really need to request question whether that relationship was ever there to begin with. Um, and, and, and that's a big piece of this, because if we're just restoring the relationship, it's kind of going back to where we were, <laughs> even if there was a relationship. And that's not what we're saying. We're, we're radically shifting. So one example is, just to, to bring it to a specific example of this UU World article, is going back to the way things were would mean continuing to write UU World articles that are focused on predominantly white, cisgendered, straight UUs, which is the, the, the center of Unitarian Universalism, versus what if we have things that are coming out in the UU world that are focused towards those of us that are on the margins, written by us, for us, that's a completely different focus. Like who, you know, what's this platform for? Who is this platform of the UU world serving? So we're specifically asking those questions in these conversations. And I know we're not the first ones to ask these questions, um, but to me that started a way of breaking open towards what's a new relationship look like. Yeah, I think that that's super important. Um, uh, you know, who's the we we are talking about? This is one of the, you know, um, questions that I, I'm hoping we're going to be asking at the General Assembly where we're talking about the power of we, quote unquote. And um, I think there's real questions in Unitarian Universalism about who the we that we're talking about is whenever we say we. Um, I think. The EU world is a manifestation and what happened um, with this article and others, you know, like the, the other thing to point out is this is not the first um, article that has been, you know, anti-trans, like that's, let's, let's be real. Um, 
and it's a manifestation of you know who that a very singular idea about who that we is and centering who that we is and that is a manifestation of of the institutionalized we of Unitarian Universalism because the theology of Unitarian Universalism is a very different we, right? If we're looking at the real theology of Unitarian Universalism, that is a very different we than what we have institutionalized as Unitarian Universalism. Um, and so, while we need our congregations to bring back um, our congregants to our theology of we, we need our institution to do that as well. And that has been one of the hardest things that I've seen, um, you know, in my time as a UU um, struggle with because I wonder, and, and I can say this more freely now that I'm not on the board, I wonder if we have it in us, the, the we of the UUA um, has it in us to do. Um, because, and the reason I wonder about that is because the lack of um, desire or desire put into action to actually dismantle it at the institutional level. Um, and, you know, the UU world has been without a person of color for almost a year. I think, I can't remember exactly when Kenny left and he was the only one, right? Um, what, where, where is, you know, what does that say? I think it says a lot, you know, I think, you know, we, the current administration of the UUA has, is going on, you know, two years of this coming GA. And I think it's reasonable to ask, what is this dismantling of the institutionalized we look like um, as we're talking about the power of we? Um, and, and I, you know, frankly, I don't see it. Um, and it concerns me because the days of folks from the margins going gently into that good night as Unitarian Universalists is over. It's over. And so, you know, that being the case, um, there's, you know, there, there comes a reckoning where, um, where our institutions have to take responsibility for either having the skills to do the work or not. And, and there's no shame in saying, we are not equipped to do this. You know, <laughs> we need help doing this. We do not know how to do this. And then revising the resources in order to get it done, right? There's no shame in that. That's, that's you know, there's, I go all the time to people and say, I don't know how to do this help me figure this out. Um, and, and then pay them for that time and then pay them for that effort. You know, there it was a lot of emotional um, labor and physical, you know, and, and, and intellectual labor that went into all of these responses that were needed for something that somebody was told not to do in the first place, right? We have you know, Mid-America doing an intersectionalities regional assembly with no basis of Kimberly Crenshaw's work. And, you know, it, having been told by somebody, hey, this isn't a good idea. You know, we have the UU World who produced an entire episode about, or issue about um, the GA worships from last GA and completely left out the first bilingual worship service done by a group of Latinx UUs. You know, com just complete erasure. So it's not that we're saying we need to fix each one of these things that is happening. We're saying, where is that institutional um, 
desire and action to change it. And if people are not equipped to do it, then we need to change that. We need to change it and we need to change it, you know, not in years, um, not in years time, you know, it, our, the patience of people from the margins and Unitarian Universalism for a change is wearing thin and it has been wearing thin. Like we've ha been having the same conversation for decades. You know, you can go to Mark Hicks and you can go to, um, you know, other UU theologians who study, um, I'm forgetting the other Mark's name right now, just like um, Mark Morrison, Morrison Reed. Reed. And, you know, you can study the history of this and nothing that we are experiencing is new. And so if it's not new, then something in the institution is maintaining that, that status quo. And, and that's what needs to change. Mm. Yeah, I, I, and the, the difficult thing is, and having done um, a little bit of um, interim work, is that if everybody in this system is not on board, whatever work that 85 or 90% of the system does can be undone by 10% who didn't wanna do it. And um, one of the things that I talk about, I've, I've, I've talked about before with congregations that are looking to do transformative work or to do radical healing from some trauma or dysfunction or whatever is I cite this utterly ridiculous source, which was a 1939 movie short by the Three Stooges, um, which is, you know, a you know, horrible Donna, example. TV show. I, I'm going to agree with you <laughs> with the TV show. But what happens in this thing is that, I think it's whichever one's bald, Curly, I guess, backs into a, a saguaro cactus. And his brothers have to get the get the tines out of him. And so one brother, I mean, it's it's the, the three stooges, so it's slapstick, has this enormous pair of pliers, and he's pulling them out one at a time. And every time he pulls one out, Curly yells. And the other brother has this enormous pair of kitchen shears. And he's just cutting them off. And one brother says, hey, what are you doing? Like, like, why are you taking him out like that? You do this, it looks, it look, he's all better already. You know, and that's the work of, of healing this kind of trauma is that, yeah, you can cut them off. But they're going to, unless you pull them out, which is going to be painful. And unless you pull them out and get some alcohol in there and clean that out and get uh, kill the germs and kill the infection, unless you do that, you're never going to dance again. That's the nature of the work. Well, and my image for this is as a gardener, that the weeds that grow in a big patch of weeds are super easy to pull out. The weeds that are really hard are the ones growing in the middle of my peonies because I love those peonies. I adore those peonies. And so I do end up being the one who cuts them off and then the weed's still there. And, you know, because I have to say, I need to let go of this peony, this beautiful flower that I love. And I think that's part of what Unitarian Universalists are looking at. Oh, this, this hymn is actually oppressive, but I love this hymn. Oh, this, you know, that we have to, those of us who are privileged have to let go of some things that we love and we're not used to having to let go of things if we're privileged and it's uh it takes a spiritual practice and discipline to be able to do that and um and 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 it's where there's life it's where there's vitality it's where there is the garden you ultimately want to grow so and, it's and the good news is we have a theology to do it <laughs> that's the really good news that we could be preaching, you know, from all the pulpits in the land is what you just said, that pain and that discomfort and, and John, what you said about, you know, it's going to hurt, but 
God bless it. We have this beautiful theology that could do it. And, and I mean, that's what keeps me in Unitarian Universalism. You know, that's, that's the part that is so hope, hopeful is that um, we have that, that tool right, right at our fingertips to be able to um, help us through that. But going back to, to, to Karen's question, even, um, there has to be institutional accountability for this work in some way. And, you know, I think, Meg, not to belabor your metaphor, but you don't have to throw the peony away, right? You have to dig it up. You, and you have to spend to hours and yes. hours and hours digging, carefully digging it up and teasing out the weed and <laughs> caring for the, the peony rhizome or whatever whatever it is. And then... And, and, and taking out the harmful things and replanting it. And if you don't have those hours and hours and hours, um, it's easier just to, to toss it in the trash and, and start over. But, um, you know, we can't toss things in the trash. That's fair. <laughs> but, but there are things so, that should be ta ta trashed, you know, yes, and, uh, including no, things no, no, no. that we love. And I have dug up my peonies and the weeds are mighty little things. <laughs> they are very mighty little things. You know, I mean, and I, I think about oppression a lot in the garden because of all the different ways that weeds come in and come out. And it's, you know, it's my main spiritual teacher, the earth. But anyway, we're not talking about me and my spiritual practice, are we? Oh yeah, <laughs> it's not about me. I forgot again. Okay, so. Uh, but, <laughs> yes. but I'm just thinking that, that you know, part of this gaslighting, part of this forgive pressure to forgive and forget comes from the white supremacy culture, the cis supremacy culture, the patriarchal culture, the kyriarchal culture, whatever you want to call it, that's at the center um, of who we are. And until um, the folks who, you know, Christina, you are very <laughs> clear that that folks are, are not forgetting, right? We're, we're you know, folks are done. Um, and until, you know, the folks that have, those of us who have some measure of privilege are also done, um, we're going to keep causing pain. And I'll, I'll use we to mean those of us who have some measure of privilege. Um, so it's, uh, and, and not to say that, I, I don't want to absent myself from the, <laughs> you know, accept myself from the, from the, the forces of of privilege that are that are centering you know so andre i'm i'm realizing oh my gosh we have five minutes left what do you want us to know about trust and what trust is doing and and what what you're hoping we'll do to support what trust is doing those of us who aren't part of trust yeah i think first off to know that um trust is growing and that there are trans you use who are religious professionals who are working in your congregations working in your communities um, and do a lot of really great work and many of them who can support a lot of the types of things that we've been talking about on this call um, there is a call to action that was published right after the article in the same issue of UU world and on the trust website um, and we actually originally published that on the trust website back in November um, and yet again, it's being overshadowed by another conversation. Um, so take a look at that and, and take action. And that involves, you know, funding organizations like Trust, um, hiring trans religious professionals within your congregation. And there's a list of them that you can see on the Trust website. Um, signing up to be an ally, um, doing things within your congregation to educate yourselves and to make these shifts. So those are the things that um, trust has been calling for. So take a look at that. Um, and, and the other thing that, that I can't say um, loudly enough is if you haven't read the article and you're cisgendered UU, you, um, read it and read all the context around it um, to understand it. That's part of supporting trust and it's part of supporting uh, trans UUs. Um, I've had so many people say to me, well, I just don't read you, you world, or I didn't read the article. Um, and you need to be in this conversation. You need to read it. You need to read everything folks have published around it. Um, 
the Commission on Institutional Change has put a blog post up that has a list of almost everything that the people have posted around this. Um, so that's where you can get a lot of that context. And something um, that was really helpful for us at the congregational level is somebody in the AUUA, which is the administrators uh, professional group. Um, if you have copies of this article, uh, or if you have copies of this episode, uh, UU World in your congregations, like a lot of times people bring them in to just have to give out to newcomers, um, paste in there the link to the replies so that it is not just standing out there on its own for new people to come in and read. Um, that That is, you know, anywhere you see this um, particular um, copy of the UU World, please paste in there. You know, you can do a, a quick link to, you know, the commission's work, to trust, and wherever, but somehow, some way, have in there um, that there is more to this story. Yeah, and I will hold up that UU World actually paid CB Beal for their medium article. So you can print that out and paste that right right in there. Um, so. And I wanted to lift up, you know, CLF has almost a thousand members who are currently incarcerated and a large number of them are trans. And for them to receive this in the mail, some of them is the first thing that they ever receive from Unitarian Universalism. And they can't go online. They can't look at this commentary. So I wanted to mention that we've been in contact with Chris Walton at The World and, and they are helping us to do a mailing to all of the incarcerated members to, to share in print some of these resources to say, um, wait a minute, that's not, that's not Unitarian Universalism as we understand it. Um, and to, to let them know that they really are welcomed to uh, CLF. So, I'm, um, that, that was particularly the pain for us is that these are people, and there are people who receive the world who don't come to bricks and mortar congregations who don't go online. And, and those are the people that, that it's really hard to figure out um, how to repair. But, I, but I'm happy to say that that kind of repairing is going on with our membership. And that it came up, someone on the trust um, steering committee brought it up at their meeting with the world. So we didn't have to initiate it, which was great intersectionality for us. Um, for what it's worth, my congregation, like I, I feel like every time I'm on here, I say, my congregation is special. They're so awesome. Um, they printed out hard copies of the president's apology, Chris Walton's apology, C.B. Beale's thing, um, something that um, Leslie Mack wrote, printed all this stuff out, stapled it into a packet and handed them out on Sunday. Uh, because, you know, we've got a lot of people who don't look at the UU world online. So we tell them, Take this home and put it in your magazine so that it's it's an in, it's a special insert. And they get that because they have inserts in their order of service, right? Oh, it's an insert. Excellent. We'll jam it in the magazine, right? Um, but you know, the the piece that Michael Slack wrote really is is sort of the the thing that just keeps ringing and ringing and ringing and the tone that carries is it's hard to assume good intention because I'm pretty sure that there aren't good intentions sometimes. And how do you repair a relationship that was toxic to begin with? You don't wanna reestablish that. So what do you do? You have to pull the tines out one at a time. There's a lot of work ahead. There's a lot of her work ahead and I'm grateful to be doing it with you all and, and the people who watched. We'll give C.B. Beale the last word because C.B. Beale printed on something on the, that I just wanna share for people listening to this who didn't read it. I was compensated for permission to put a link to my medium piece on the UUA website in conjunction with the apology. That's not related to permission to print, which I just give anyone in congregations. So thank you for that generosity. I, um, 
yeah, thank you. And for your wisdom, it's a great piece. Any final words from anyone? Andre, anything you didn't get to say? Yeah, thanks for having me here. And again, take a look at those call to action and bring those to your congregation and take some steps, donate to trust. You can do it right on our website and um, begin figuring out what your congregation is gonna do. Thanks so much. And we hope you'll come back. We wanted you to come before this. And <laughs> you're always welcome here. So thank you. Thanks. thanks everyone. Next week, we'll be talking um, with folks who are finding our way home about, about what was special and different and exciting and wonderful. And maybe hard too. I don't know. I wasn't there. So uh, see you then. Thank you. Bye-bye.